yourself and this is why you are inviting me uh, to, to, to uh, give me the opportunity to talk about my practice and other interests um, in relationship to the, the themes that are being drawn out of the, the actual exhibition itself. Now, um, I did originally propose that this, this uh, event would have been a symposium where I would have invited various academics, et cetera, to come and do a, a kind of talk about the use of flags within uh, protest, but also um, within art practice as well. But um, due to certain kind of issues and restrictions, of course, that, that changed. And, um, but uh, luckily, I'm able to kind of present to you tonight um, some of my own thoughts in regards to these issues. So I'm going to try and keep this quite casual. And uh, if anybody has any questions, please kind of like raise your hand or, or kind of put some in the chat as well. Um, and I can pick up on those as well. Um, so I'm going to use PowerPoint, but I don't want to kind of overuse PowerPoint. I want it more to do with kind of the context of the work. I'll talk about processes within the practice and the content, but um, hopefully, um, and I know this can sometimes be difficult, it, hopefully that we can kind of create some type of conversation around uh, sort of the, the issues that I'm raising and maybe you can kind of help me with some of the inquiry that I'm trying to uh, deal with in my own work because um, I certainly don't have a lot of answers or all the answers to why I'm doing certain things or how I'm doing certain things or, or where these things can go next so I think it, it would be a kind of nice uh, almost like um, a, a, a kind of social community type of activity for people to kind of give input into, into, into what, what I'm kind of saying. Um, and whether, you know, I might kind of make some provocative remarks. I mean, sometimes uh, you know, those are always quite kind of um, interesting to make in order for people to kind of make a uh, decision around. So we'll kind of see how this goes. I mean, some of the most interesting, I suppose, uh, aspects for me in regards to the, the, the agenda for the, for the exhibition were to do with uh, protest but within a Welsh context, uh, particularly within a, a rural Welsh context. How as a as a person who lives in rural Wales but close to the border, those types of contexts that are kind of more, I suppose they can be quite both ambiguous but also activated as well because you live on the border between England and Wales. And that again creates a certain type of tension there. Now, I'm not saying that any of my work is uh, has a, a kind of a, a kind of global type of um, sort of impact. I would say it was it, it's very local, but it does, I suppose, have a conversation within it that could possibly uh, raise it towards more global issues, uh, particularly in, in terms of colonialism and post-colonialism, and that's a a certain area that I tend to work in um, with, uh, with, uh, within my work to do with kind of Welsh English tensions, but also the tensions within Wales as well. Um, and, you know, tensions that seem to kind of appear every so often. Um, they dissipate and then appear again. And these kind of issues have kind of historically been uh, kind of dealt with by artists. Um, and within a Welsh context um, as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as I, I, as I kind of meander around uh, uh, the work, but also I'm going to try and lay out a kind of theoretical concept in the work as well. Now, what I call heterotopic friction, which is a term that's about this notion of where reality and the, the kind of the realm of the imagined clash meet. Clash might be a kind of bigger term for this, but they kind of come up and they rub against each other. And as an artist, I'm quite interested in those zones of friction between the imagined and the real, and how we kind of navigate those, and how as artists we can almost, we can visualize them, but also create uh, a sense of um, 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 uh, transforming ideas or transforming ways of thinking 
through our art practice. I'm a great um, reader of Chantal Mouffe, who is a friend, uh, uh, kind of a, a post-Marxist uh, political theorist, who um, in a conversation with Guerra talked about this idea of what art practice could do politically. And she came up with this amazing, I suppose, observation that uh, artists or art uh, is a way in which we mobilize uh, uh, effectively our emotions. Yeah, so we kind of we affect uh, the society, we affect the world by by kind of creating artworks, and that is really kind of at the heart of I think kind of what this this uh, exhibition and also the work within it is actually operating within this effective domain um, of the artist. I'm also a great um, reader of Francis Alice, uh, a kind of Belgian artist kind of working in Mexico. And a lot of his work has been very much about the political, but in, in, a, in a way, a political viewed from the outside. So he's a, a kind of from, from Europe, but has settled in Mexico, and is able to, I suppose, navigate certain types of issues in Mexico that um, uh, are, are kind of like politically charged. So I'm going to kind of look at those within this notion of heterotopic friction together with my own practice. And also another layer, so stay with me there, another layer is to do with humour in, uh, in art practice and also humour in protest and political art works. Um, there's an artist, I don't know if anybody's familiar with him, Marcus Coates, who has used humour in his practice, um, not um, overtly uh, using it, but kind of conscious of the way that humour can be used in his work or perceived in his work in order to um, operate within some very type of uh, politically charged situations. Um, and he, he's kind of like, you know, he's, uh, he, he's very serious in what he does, but there's also a sense of this uh, notion of, of the, the absurd in his work, or the idea of him becoming the fool in his practice, in order to, um, uh, uh, to kind of create a discussion around certain issues that perhaps, you know, politicians or people within government or etc. can't really um, access or be allowed to, to do. So I'm quite interested in that in the practice as well, and how I navigate or negotiate quite uh, what could be politically charged or quite difficult pieces of work, but for humor. Now, of course, not that can't happen all the time because things can be kind of quite misread, etc. Or you can actually um, uh, turn an audience away from a piece of work by, by being like that. But also in terms of audience, it's quite fascinating that, you know, being too aggressive in art practice can also turn the audience away. Um, so there's a fine balance between the absurd and the, the kind of more aggressive natures of, pro, of, of art within protest and politics as well. So I'm going to just um, talk about this idea of um, my art practice. I'm gonna share my screen and just give you some examples um, of that. So, okay, so, there you go. so I'm just wondering, can everybody see the screen? Yeah, the screen's so fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and unfortunately what happens here is that I can't see the chat. So if anybody does have any kind of remarks, I'll try and pick up on, pick up on that later on. So let me just take you to a kind of a, a, a piece of work um, that um, I suppose starts to um, articulate some of the uh, political uh, issues that were, were kind of floating around in one's mind um, for quite a few years. But before that, my practice never really picked up on or, or, was, or, or wasn't ready to deal with at that point. Originally, I had been a uh, painter um, uh, of, of landscapes, but uh, landscapes that were quite um, urban and also quite run down. I was quite interested in areas of, of um, uh, demise. In a way, I was quite fascinated by that aspect, and I suppose there's a kind of there's a political nature to that, you know, kind of areas of, of deprivation, areas of of, of struggle, and particularly in North Wales, where there is a kind of certain amount of poverty and a certain amount of high housing issues, 
I was quite interested in recording those things within paint. So I thought paint was the medium I was going to use for the rest of my life. Um, but um, one thing leads to another and uh, through sales of paintings, I was able to buy a video camera. And with that video camera, I started to, to kind of turn it both on myself, but also use it as a documenting device. Um, recording situations. I found video to be much more instant in terms of communicating those things that I wanted to, um, I suppose, uh, uh, visualize. And it started to make me think about, well, performance from oneself within a situation and also, you know, the use of the camera as an immediate vehicle to, uh, to kind of, uh, communicate a certain type of idea. It was, it was a, a very interesting area to explore. So I, I started to work in performance a lot more after that, um, I suppose, little uh, uh, discovery. And um, I also started to read a lot more about conceptual art, because prior to that, my training had been very much in graphic arts and painting. And um, I felt, um, in a lot of ways, my education in art practice has been a little bit uh, short changed because I was with a bunch of painters and I kind of didn't realize that there was this more bigger world out there, conceptual art practices, etc., which was more in keeping with the type of ideas I was developing as my art practice uh, also kind of progressed. So um, to kind of like bring this back into, into this particular uh, series of slides, this is a piece of work that um, I uh, did for a, a festival in Manchester, which run, ran alongside a really fantastic exhibition by Mary Griffiths at uh, the, the gallery there um, uh, that was based about around boundaries. And for this particular um, exhibition, I uh, proposed that I would take a one a kind of square tray of Welsh soil and deposit it within the ground of the gallery space and claim that area as Wales, thus taking over um, the sovereignty of that part of the part of the landscape. And there was an interesting fact that um, in Wales we have a, a kind of quite a history of what's called enclaves and enclave, exclaves. And there was one um, just outside of uh, Rex uh, called Flintshire Detached. And we're talking, I think, 15th, 16th century, maybe, and kind of quite, and, and also kind of like into the 20th century as well. If I'm right, so you might correct me on that. Um, so there was a history of this notion of claiming land or having land um, um, surrounded by another piece of land. Um, that belonged to Wales. So I took this premise and I, I started quite provocatively and quite humorously playing about with it and on the grounds of the, of, of the, of the uh, gallery space itself. And to make it even more absurd in a way, I kind of brought myself in there with a Welsh flag and really overemphasizing this notion of Welshness, Welsh, a place of Welsh, with a, a, a mock sign of welcome to Glace of Company, welcome to Wales. Uh, and a, a, a Welsh anthem playing on a, on a little CD deck, and people would be very curious, of course, and wonder what I was uh, what I was doing. So, I talked about Marcus Coates acting the fool, and it was a very similar scenario of, of somebody that I was acting a certain type of character that, in a way, I was acting quite naive, and I was saying, "Well, I've kind of brought this is Wales now. I've brought Wales here, and you know, would you like to come and you know, kind of visit Wales?" And people would kind of you know step onto the soil and then I would kind of give them a little uh, stamp saying welcome to Wales the dates on so it's almost like a passport uh, scenario but in essence the most important thing about this um, is the dialogue that it created okay there's kind of these um, motifs of Welshness in there and motifs of territoriality and uh, and tropes of, of kind of, um, of culture and, and uh, and clo colonialization within the, within this work, but it was about a, it was a vehicle for dialogue, and I always remember Hans Hacker talking about conceptual artwork 
being about a vehicle for the idea and you know whatever that might be video photography painting it's the idea was the importance of emotion so even though this is a visually uh, I suppose uh, stimulating it's a visual uh, in a word, it attracts people in. It was the dialogues that I was I was involved in that were, the, for me, the most important part of this exhibit, uh, this piece of work. And they ranged from things that were quite general, that were where people were talking about, you know, visiting Wales and the beauty of Wales. So there was a notion of a landscape, uh, the idea of like, you know, being being uh, having a, a kind of connection to that. But there was also this idea of um, 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 the idea of, of land and territory as well being discussed uh, within it. And, you know, this, I, this notion that the whole history of, of like invade, invading countries was discussed and, you know, there were people from other countries that where we kind of got into the conversations of, of language and, you know, protection of language in other countries, etc. for example. So it kind of really it grew, the, the conversations grew and grew out of this experience. So it was a real, this was one of the first times I've kind of experimented with working with the public, and uh, working in a more political, child, uh, political uh, sense, and, um, and also uh, realizing that um, dialogue is an art practice, can be an art practice. And I was referring to people like um, Kester, um, who wrote Dialogical Aesthetics, and the, the idea of you know, the, the conversation was actually part of that. And it was linking in with these notions of relational aesthetics, public art, and social engaged practices also. So there's a lot of, um, I suppose, trajectories and networks going on within what I was actually practicing, together with this notion of um, a political art. And it's something that later on, which I'll kind of talk about, um, um, makes people think more about, well, you know, um, does art practice have to be so, uh, a relational aesthetics and uh, relational art have to be so convivial in a way? Um, can it be more confrontational? Can it be more com about, more about conflict? Uh, so that's kind of uh, one of the works that I was kind of embarking upon, this, this notion of protest. Then as I was standing on that, soil all different types of ideas were starting to emerge as to what types of projects i could run later on i had this idea of the flag and you know holding this flag for so long uh, over the duration of the performances um you, it kind of makes you think well, you know there's something really powerful about flags uh, and they, they stand for they stand in for so many things uh, that they're, they're kind of like you know they're, they're both symbols and they're, they're, they're both about kind of express the culture. They communicate um, to uh, they communicate over miles. They communicate over landscapes. They communicate psychologically as well. So there's a lot of um, I sort of realised there's flags of being these loaded symbols in society in in in, in culture as well. So. I went back and I kind of, you know, started to do a lot of research into flags and the history of them, and you know, all, all the types of kind of scenarios and kind of what what they mean. And there was some really amazing um, types of writing, particularly in the, the regard of, of um, flags as heterotopic, which I'm quite fascinated by. You know, Foucault's notion of heterotopia um, and, and the practices of that. In a broad sense, I know that that particular text, if you read it. It's a very short text that was given, a, you know, as a, as a talk, and you know, there's, 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 there's so much packed into it for people to kind of unload. So, I was looking at a lot of work that I started to produce was more about looking at um, how um, flags act as territorial markers. Um, I was also quite interested when I kind of made that piece of earth, that, that soil uh, tray, the enclave, uh, how land is important and the idea of occupying land um, and explorations and invasions, etc. And also creating land, creating land, creating new countries. And there's been a whole host of, a host of artists that have created their own 
uh, worlds in their own uh, countries, et cetera, so, uh, when, when you do the research. And, and, and I, I kind of explore this and I'll kind of show you a little bit more about that uh, uh, soon. Um, so, but I did a series that were based on almost like, I don't know, cliche types of images of, of explorers and exploration and, and, and kind of photographs. And the, the, the idea of the rookie figure, which comes from Caspar David Friedrich, you know, this idea of the, the, you, you kind of view somebody from the back and they kind of look out into this vast wilderness or landscape. And it's about this projecting oneself into that space. And a lot of advertising use it as well in the, in, in, in the, as a device in order for people to project themselves into, you know, to kind of places of, of that they want to visit. So a lot of I kind of I did a whole series of these things where you know I was looking at the, looking towards these new frontiers and I was creating a narrative about exploration and the idea of, of, of kind of you know, territoriality, creating territory, claiming territory, and I created this flag with the colours of of the Welsh flag within it, but also with connotations to uh, other types of rebellion flags or protest flags within it. So you, um, it, was, it was quite loaded within, within its, its, its shape and it's, and it, 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 um, it's, it's kind of um, um, the, the kind of like the, the, the triangle, et cetera, within that. So, uh, the, so the, I was kind of very much aware of, I was playing with um, a lot of type of reference points within this work. So, uh, and also, the, we, returning back to that what, um, notion of the conversations we had, and the charge of landscape in, in a national uh, consciousness, uh, a nation's consciousness, and the way that people perceive Wales, and the way that we talk about Wales within our anthem, and the hills, the mountains, the landscape, the, the, the kind of the rivers, the valleys, etc. I was looking, thinking about that also, and the way that uh, we we are very protective over uh, over landscape and, and these certain types of ideas of landscape. And you know, again, I was like, more more playing with this idea of absurdity and humor and exploration, and you know, looking at other type of protests that had gone on and kind of stuff was a, a kind of protest, you know, the kind of ramblers protest and etc. I was playing around with using. Uh, the same flag, the same flag keeps emerging throughout the practice. Uh, it's something that I've kind of hooked on because, again, it's a, it's a very useful vehicle to describe certain types of um, notions of, 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 kind of, um, of po the politics. So this was from a series of uh, slides of, of, um, of environments that were kind of, you know, from, from that area, but also beyond it into, into the Alps, etc. And it was quite a uh, and I had a voice over explaining about rambling and about uh, uh, making, uh, the idea of trespass and, and things like that, which I was kind of very much interested in at the time. And I did a whole series of works where I followed, I was crossing over boundaries between England and Wales, but also boundaries between people's houses and, and, uh, and, and their gardens and, and like the little gaps in between the gardens and the bush. That were no man land because they weren't owned by anybody. So I used to kind of trespass on these kind of areas, did a whole series of works into that. So it kind of led, led me into these, these eight areas of, of um, ownership, et cetera, of land. And through my um, research and, 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 and kind of like art practice, I began to read a lot of, um, I suppose, politically charged. Um, Welsh um, text and Welsh theory and Welsh, Welsh uh, nationalist works. And some of them come to mind just as like the Welsh extremist by uh, Thomas. And also, um, is it Hearn's, um, the ABC of Welsh, Re A to Z of Welsh Revolution, I think it was called. And, and I think it was kind of like, um, something like that. And, and I was quite fascinated by these. I'll kind of come back to that in a minute. About this. Of the ABC of Welsh, I think it's ABC of Welsh Revolution. Um, and um, I also kind of did not read, but I came across this book by J.R. Jones, the Dean Dodd. And the, the, this was a really fascinating discovery for me because I don't know if anybody's familiar with J.R. Jones and um, whether they've read any of his work in Welsh because he, re he writes in Welsh for a Welsh audience. And, and they're incredible, they're, uh, you know, they're incredible books about Wales at a certain point in time in history. 
written in 1966. And J.I. George is writing in response to this idea of the threat of, um, of, of the or loss of what the Welsh culture, Welsh identity, and Welsh land. And he said it's being almost forced into this idea of Britishness. And by being forced into this notion of Britishness, we are losing our sense of self. So this book is a, is a call out. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a, a kind of a, a, a call to, to arms, as I could kind of like describe it. Maybe let's get over the top, but a call to arms to say, listen, there's a kind of serious issue appearing here that if we don't respond to it, we are going to lose our notion of identity. And within that notion, they have the idea of a language, a land, and sovereignty. And the, without any, without those three, we can't be a land. So there's quite a fascinating aspect to this. So I started to try and find ways of, of kind of getting into this book. I I um I was asking people who are Welsh who are Welsh uh, speakers to translate some of these things. I was reading people like uh, Phillips, who wrote an amazing book about J.R. Jones, a big section of African God. And I wanted to kind of start working with this idea of Britishness because myself as a you know you kind of have that notion of i live by the border i have i i, I kind of I'm a, I'm a welsh person but not a welsh speaker you have those types of um, scenarios of feeling lost in one's own uh, in one's own um, kind of country i suppose so um, i kind of I, I wanted to play around with that a bit and talk about this idea of well britishness welshness what they mean to me because I, I suppose i live so much much closer psychologically to these two things uh, because of not being a welsh speaker first language welsh speaker even even a second language welsh speaker so there's a lot of uh, context there for me to, to unpack and to, and to keep working with so i created with the idea of the flag i created these series of flags that um were were were, were emerging of different types of contacts within them and you know i had this idea of this uh, the david you know saint david's flag with the gold cross on black and i used that as a a, a, um, a palette you know to create these two pieces of work so everybody's language and also you know the idea of the britishness and i entered these into the i studied thinking that they would never get chosen because I didn't know whether, how they would be read um, by the judges, but also by the, um, by, by the audience. But thankfully, you know, it was, you know and it, it really helped in regards to getting, uh, for me to kind of think, to, to think more about the context of what I'm doing. They got accepted and there was really, really nice write-up by Eddie Land about, um, about uh, the notion of uh, Britishness and, 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 and Welsh identity and how as an artist you have to think both about being an artist in Wales but also being an artist internationally as well and the struggles that you have with trying to I suppose retain one's sense of, of, of looking at one's own culture but also uh, operating within the wider field of, um, of, of, of an international stage. Um, so these flags were actually flown from the, the gallery space in the Eisteddfod in 2014 and um, together with banners from either side and it was quite fascinating because the banners that were around it were more to do with commercial and sponsored banners so besides the Pradindog flag there was a flag for principality insurance company and I found that quite funny and almost as a, as a kind of there was a strange connection to them in, in, in some ways because I was thinking of principality and how Wales has been seen as a principality uh, historically um, and then thinking about this idea of what J.R. Jones is saying the danger of becoming British out of wet you know Welsh scenario uh, really kind of really brought something there to it so you know these these works were really charged in, in what I uh, from, from me and then I Further developed this piece of work where I went for walks um, around local areas in, in, in North Wales, and I took this flag with me and I did a procession almost of this flag. And again, it was coming back to that idea of uh, wanting to have engagement with people more and, and, and have that relational type of conversation with people. So I 
took this flight for a walk around Wrexham town and every so often somebody would stop me and say what's that what does it say and then we would engage in a conversation which again enriched and enlightened the types of uh, types of thinking around what was going on here. When they, were, uh, when they were exhibited in the Ice Dead it was quite fascinating because I had a, a friend come to me and he said they didn't realise it was my work at first and they were standing outside of the gallery space and they were looking up at the actual um, flags and saying what, what is that? Why have they put that there? And how do I feel about that? So they felt not, in, in some ways it made them question this idea uh, of, of identity, they were saying. So I thought that that obviously kind of, that obviously was you know uh, one of the intentions for the work. Of course, I never set out to make a work that is you know forced into trying to be uh, to, to, to to communicate a certain type of message or to or to, or to, or to, or to close people into too much of a um, a, a text in a way. I always think that there has to be a, a bit of openness to a, piece, a work, a, a slight ambiguity to a piece of work in order for people to fill in um, their own interpretations and their own thoughts around something. And I think that's very important in whether you're making work that is uh, within, within activist work or, 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 or work is, is to make sure that people have a way into it um, um, as an artwork itself. And again, this this piece of this other piece of work, where you know, I think was exhibited later on, um, and it's part of the show um, here at the Elysium uh, Gallery as well. So, and this was um, again the idea of the protest and the idea of the the, the, the uh, language language issues and, and 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 how these are are still relevant and still here now, um, even though we deal with post revolution etc. Uh, in, in, and, and this idea of like a one Wales and um, that everybody is Welsh and you don't have to be Anglo Welsh, you don't have to be this Welsh or that Welsh, you are just Welsh. I, I still think there's problematics within that. I still don't believe that people are fully convinced that there can be, and there's a nice provocative question. People are not, you know, there's many different types of Welshness um, and there's a hierarchy of Welshness as well. So I think there's, uh, and, and particularly Welsh language is very much rooted in this idea. And so I was maybe also playing around with this idea of um, um, what, what a language means and is everybody's language and well, does it belong to some, does it belong to others? Um, um, and and, 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 and the, the, the idea of how a language is so rooted in culture that as a, as a non-Welsh speaker, do I still, I still have those passions for it? I will still defend it. Um, um, I still think it's an important part of, 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 of retaining a sense of identity, et cetera. So there's a lot of, and, and there's a lot of talk and conversation around that. Within it. And of course, you know, looking at other types of symbols of, of protest. So the, 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 the speaker, which again is a, is a symbol of protest. You, you, you communicate with people using these, these, uh, these loudspeakers, etc. And um, in one of the exhibitions, it was where people could come up and they would speak either in Welsh or English about their feelings uh, in terms of the language and the politics and the culture, etc. So it was a series where it was the, 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 the loudspeaker becomes active and activated by uh, people uh, with, 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 the, kind of, like with this um, discussion. There was another more, I suppose, fun project that I was doing um, in the meantime, as all this was going on and, and also developing out of some of the other projects where I met this very interesting um, uh, person um, who was based in, 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 in Badal and Flintshire. And I got to talking to them about uh, creating a, a, a republic, his own land. And because he lived in Flintshire, he wanted to um, take over Flintshire, make it into a republic, so it was separate from Wales. And as I said earlier on, there's you know the whole history to this of taking over land, 
and, and claiming new spaces, etc. So I agree that I would um, create some type of visuals for, for this idea. And we, we collaborated uh, on, on, um, on creating a flag and, and uh, an identity and, and uh, a billboard where we were saying, you know, vote for a republic, uh, separating Flintshire from the rest of Wales, uh, promoting its qualities of landscape, its, its industries, etc. And then creating a manifesto, which was read out in a town hall uh, by, by um, Frank, uh, which was based on uh, a manifesto that was in Hearn's ABC of Welsh Revolution, but we altered it in order to fit it into the idea of an English-speaking uh, part of Wales um, and also a, a, an independent economic part of Welsh as well. But also having a, a dig at the English also for their colonisation of the area. So that was quite, it was fun, but it also had a, and it was, it was a fun and absurd in some ways, uh, but it also, you know, it touched on these other issues along, along the way. And I suppose that gets back to this, another part of this notion of heterotopic frictions, which I talked about at the beginning, where it's, you know, these, these frictions are not meant to be too overly aggressive. Um, Claire Bishop talks about it, this idea of uh, relational antagonism. And I used to think about this notion of antagonism. And I used to think, well, is my work antagonistic? You know, do I like to be antagonistic? In some ways I did, but in other ways I didn't like that idea. I didn't want to be aggressive. I don't think I'm a very aggressive person. Uh, I don't think the, the, the type that comes out in the work. I think there's a mildness to some of this work in a lot of ways. So I started to think, well, maybe it's not antagonism that I'm interested in, but maybe it's something else. And it was um, the idea of, a kind of, Ruth kind of talks about this notion of critical art practice. And um, it was from antagonism, she gets this idea of, well, maybe it's more about um, coming together but not reaching a consensus, but not also seeing the other person as an enemy, but seeing them as maybe uh, adversary or somebody other that doesn't, doesn't agree or has different viewpoints. So this idea of, okay, well, other people have different viewpoints, that's fair, but let's see how we can um, visualize these and get them in the open rather than them being hidden or conf 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 within conflict. Um, so let's have a have a go exploring that in the practice. So my work wasn't about, you know, about antagonism per se, because there are many different antagonisms in the world. And, and um, the idea is, well, let's, let's get those out in the open and let's not say, okay, there's going to be a consensus and agreement here, but let's see how they, they can be uh, um, discussed and, and, and brought and, and then visual and, and then I suppose not visualized, but, um, uh, not merged, but even kind of brought into some type of arena where things can be um, uh, presented. Okay, so that I'm kind of getting into kind of some deep, deep water here because I'm also saying, well, is there no resolution anywhere? Is it just about you know having these things in the public domain? So, so let's let's kind of maybe kind of think about that as we go along. Let's think about that. So. Um, I just put this in because, again, it was uh, an exhibition that I did in Aberystwyth Arts Centre um, a couple of years back called Frontier Territory. And this flag keep, kept emerging um, for this show and actually became the basis of the show's graphical uh, motif in a way. Um, and I was able to bring things together within this show uh, as a cohesive body of work and also have uh, the text and the theory come together as well within that. And I was very much interested in this idea of, well, how do artists appropriate uh, the, 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 the symbols of uh, territoriality and symbols, uh, uh, markers of culture, et cetera, how do they, they, they use these as devices within their practice? And 
for me particularly. And it's a very subjective, it was a very subjective um, approach to, to creating work and making work and also exhibiting the work. Um, but also it was again another vehicle in order for people to um, talk about the work. So we had a symposium and I had um, two uh, theorists and academics come along and talk about this idea of identity and culture and, and uh, different perspectives, uh, particularly within the Welsh perspective and also internationally as well. And so it was very, uh, it was uh, again another interesting reading around these subjects. Um, again, you know, flags are still playing a part in this work and these are some of the most recent pieces of work that I've, 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 I've done and they're to do with the notion of folding flags in ritualistic ways and also um, um, flags that are used uh, to cover bodies, etc. very macabre, uh, but and also in terms of the, the knot in a flag. Now it's interesting because it refers to something that um, Franz Alice did in regards to, um, I think it was corruption of the voting system in Mexico at one point. He, he, he took a flag and he tied a knot, a Mexican flag, he tied a knot in it. And supposedly the knot in a flag symbolizes a distress uh, call. So it's a, I think it's a nautical um, um, symbol. So if you tie a, a, a knot in it, it's, it's symbolizing there's a distress, there's a distress call. So I'm, I was quite fascinated in, 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 in exploring this as a, as a symbol um, as well within the work. So I'm, I'm still working on these things. So they're not resolved yet. And the idea of territoriality and, and et cetera is, 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 is certainly being worked out. And of course, I've now been working in, because of COVID, et cetera, and not being able to get out and access certain areas. I've been working a lot with digital art practices. So I've been using game engines a lot and then creating these landscapes and placing these flags within them. But I can't talk much about these at the minute because they're still in process. There's, I'm still thinking about them. Um, and I always find, um, I remember Stesica saying this, and it was something that really resonated with me, that you can't really talk about the work you're doing right now with any type of clarity because you're still processing what's going on. And I feel as if this is happening within the, 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 certainly the digital work that I'm starting to produce, um, where I'm creating boundaries in street corners and, and, and replicating protest um, environments where something might, something, a riot may have happened. Um, so I'm, trying, I'm, I'm still trying to absorb what I'm, I'm, I'm doing there. So hopefully, you know, maybe about three years down the line, I'll be able to articulate clearly what that's about. And then just finally, I'm just going to kind of show you two more slides before we stop this. But just an extension of, of um, some of the other types of uh, approaches that I've been uh, involved in uh, within the practices. And, um, looking at site, location, historical, and also in culture. So I've worked um, with Oriol Wrexham, which is now T-Pow, on the project when they were in between spaces. Uh, it was um, Oriol, it was like... Um, almost like a, a, a dispersed type of gallery space. I worked on a, a, a project where I created this um, um, play. And I don't know if anybody knows the Mama Plays, and there's also um, um, there's a Welsh version of the Mama Plays as well, and uh, that, that were based in Denbyshire. Um, um, and, and I think they were called the Welsh Interludes, where you have a, 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 a knight and the dragon and a doctor Etc. Well, I played around with this on the border between England and Wales in Holt uh, and Bandon. And Bandon is on the English side and Holt is on the Welsh side. And they've got this amazing, beautiful 13th century uh, bridge. It's very narrow, but it links England and Wales together at that point. And what I did is I reenacted this Amumma's play uh, using a knight and a Welsh dragon and a DJ uh, who who was playing this like really high octane type of um, uh, music while these two uh, complete, competing um, political kind of symbols fought. The Welsh dragon was throw, throwing leaks at the, at the knight and the knight was hitting the dragon with his sword. And to be incredibly, you know, to be a little bit more provocative in this in terms of the, the kind of frictions, I allow, I kind of directed it so that the, the knight actually defeated the dragon. 
And a great comment was made by somebody in the audience saying, you know, a Welsh dragon slain on Welsh soil, that would never happen. And that was, I thought that was absolutely amazing to kind of you know, kind of have that type of reaction there. So I just wanted to kind of end it maybe there now because we are kind of getting on. And thank you so much for listening to me talking about the practice and some of the ideas around it um, and concepts around it. So thank you very much for your patience. So I'll stop, I'll stop sharing now, and see if there's any questions. So has anyone got any questions for Paul then? It's all right. Normally I'm very quiet at this point <laughs> as well. <laughs> Never ask a question. Um, yeah, I have a question. I'm just really interested in the flag. As ha when I think, me personally, when I think of a flag, I find it as quite a static symbol. Um, yeah. And it, it really reduces things to sort of one point. And um, yeah, rather than a progressive or progressive symbol, I just wondered if you had any thoughts around around that. I, 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 I sense that taking it out of context brings the tension that sort of Claire Bishop talks about. Um, but like I said, uh, you also talked about openness and being openness in a work, whereas actually I find it as an item, like I said, for me, quite fixed. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dan. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of conversation around this. And um, I remember once I was in a talk and I, in a conference. And I, I don't know whether I made a fatal error by saying this, but it was something that I read and saying that, well, uh, a flag has to be as empty as possible for it to be filled in by whoever wants to use it, you know. So, and then I kind of got this, no, it's not, it's a fixed thing. It's a, it's a thing that's, you know, that it, it's a, it, it, it symbolizes something and it's, it's there. So I, I kind of like, I, 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 you know, I started saying, well, yeah, maybe it is something that is more, you know, concrete. In a way, so, but then you know, I kind of, I, I, I suppose, I, in another way, I was thinking, yeah, it's concrete, but also, you know, it depends on who picks that that flag and starts waving it, and does that flag start symbolising a certain type of ideology, in a way, a certain type of way of thinking? So I, you know, I've kind of, I, I think, you know, it's kind of interesting kind of conversation about, you know, how open these things are or how closed they are. Um, it depends on, I suppose, the. The, the, the way, the, the, the thinking around them. And I read a really good essay by, in, in, I don't know if anybody reads Eflux, it's, uh, I read a really great essay in Eflux about, by Tim Pollitt about the heterotopic nature of flags and about how they can work on various different levels and how they work both as a material object, but also um, you know, through this idea of um, even um, through a, a kind of virtual object as well. And that was a really kind of, that was a really interesting essay in terms of opening up a conversation about the possibilities of where where flags, how flags can be negotiated, navigated. navigated by so, thanks. thanks. Um, um, sorry, can I just follow that up quickly? I sure, just, please, I, please. So great. What, what, what I'm really thinking is, uh, in my mind, is whether the Welsh flag is symbolic of a sort of inclusive and progressive Wales and uh, that's what I'm interested in or does it hark back to a sort of more different Wales or a more traditional Wales that's the bit that I'm kind of wrestling with in in it and maybe that's just me and how I come to it and maybe you know that's that but um I suppose that's the point I'm kind of driving at about it so maybe not fixed but um yeah and whether it can change and it can and it can constantly move and keep up with the times I guess great, absolutely fantastic yeah we're a great we're a great way of thinking about you know particularly the Welsh flag itself I mean you know because I'm just thinking you know because this flag it's quite new isn't it really I think it's quite new the flag in Wales yeah. like 1950s is it I can't remember now but, yeah. you know so it's 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 you know so this is so it you know what was prior to that and what what possibly you know think I, I'm sure the flags you know, do flag can flags be changed? You know, in, in countries, there's a history of flags changing in countries. Well, certainly when they're invaded, maybe. But you know, um, that's quite a fascinating kind of perspective to look from. Thank you. Good. Is is there a difference though between the flag and the symbol? So I, I kind of like see the Welsh 
dragon as not necessarily a flag anymore, more of a kind of a, you know, you see its image, you go, all right, that represents Wales, that's Wales. The idea of a flag for me is something quite um, aggressive, sort of, you know, like, you know, man goes to the moon, and what's the first yeah. thing it does? Just plants that bloody American oh. flag <laughs> right there, you know. And um, yeah. I think of a flag, I, you know, I think of wars, and you think of the old, like, you know, American Civil War for, um, films and wars and whatever, and them flying the flags and planting them down, you know. Um, yeah. So that I, 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 are we talking about the same thing, like the symbol of like the dragon or or, or, or the flag? Are they are they two separate things now? If you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean just just to maybe kind of like just a little kind of deviation and bring it back again. There was a great piece of work by I think it was Larissa San, uh, Sansor called Space Exodus, where she plants the Palestinian flag on the moon. <laughs> a really fantastic piece of work. So kind of this idea of claiming places, claiming territory with that. And also I was thinking about, you know, the, the Welsh flag and, and, um, and something that I wanted to kind of pick up on, but I didn't have time. But, um, and sorry, I'll come back to the idea of like symbols and flags in a minute, but the idea of, um, when I've been walking around the village that I live in, and also when I've been driving, I've been seeing a lot of kind of flags flying uh, um, over the COVID period. And what I'm finding is that I'm seeing a, British, a kind of England, a, 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 the, the Jap Union flag and the Welsh flag underneath it. And I'm kind of quite curious because I'm seeing this in Wales, you know, and I'm seeing, well, that's the English, uh, the, sorry, the kind of Union flag above the Welsh flag and I think well why are people doing that why why isn't the Welsh flag on top is there some type of hierarchy of belonging being um displayed here in these in these in these flags I don't know if anybody else has seen that but I can I find that quite fascinating in regards well I, I mean in terms of the you know the Welsh the, the symbol of the dragon I mean again there's this is kind of steeped in mythology and history isn't it the idea of where does the dragon originate from in the Welsh flag? Some people say, well, it's a residue of the Roman, in the Roman colonization of the of, 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 of the British Isles, and it's appropriated from that. Some people say it's like steeped in English, I suppose, could be, you know, I think the British from the century. So even that has a has a, a an, even that can be quite problematic in itself. I mean, the only other place I think is it Nepal has the dragon on there. On their um, on their um, as their emblem on a, on a on a flag. I mean, and but most flags just have abstract things on them. Most flags, you know, you have this um, either cross or a chevron or the split in the uh, you know tricolor. But we, you know, 1950s flag. No, it was you know we'll we'll put a dragon on that two-color bar. So it's, it's quite fascinating. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, John, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, perhaps you can tell from my voice that I'm not a native of Wales, but I have had my children here, so that is a qualification. Um, I, I, I want to take you back, if I can, to the sort of general issues of the um, political ambitions for art uh, and the various understandings of its sort of functionality. Because um, it seems to me, and I, I've always got in the back of my mind Bertolt Brecht, you see, which is from a previous generation's discussions about all this, um, that um, the, this basic issue of how you, which I think you touched on in talking about um, being um, not being a, an aggressive person and wanting to be sort of relatively convivial and, and so on, um, there's a sort of basic issue of um, uh, attracting attention to the aesthetic encounter and once the encounter has been engaged maintaining the attention so that's a basic technical task isn't it for art you've got to get them there looking at it and then you've got to get them actually staying there and not turning around with a sort of revulsion response um, uh, and then once they you've got their attention and uh, they're maintaining it. Um, 
my feeling about what you're doing is that because you're sort of slightly worried about um, not wanting to be uh, aggressive, that you want to stop at the point where you draw people's attention to an issue. Okay, mm -hmm. so you know, play about with Welsh flags, and that obviously raises the question of Welsh identity and Welsh politics, the relationship between Wales and England, and all the rest of it. Okay, um, but then there's another thing, and this is where I think the Brechtian model um, perhaps can be brought to bear, and that is that you might want them to think something in particular about the issue. Okay, so up to the point where you get people attending to the issue of national identity and but then moving them on to uh wanting to think something in particular that you want them to think you have an interest in getting them to think this about welsh identity and why it's important for their lives and then of course you might want to go on and this is more brecht uh what do you do about it to actually change the circumstances within which the interest in say welsh identity might be coming up um that is you know a big ask right uh, because in moving from you know drawing it getting them to pay attention to getting them to think something in particular about what you can do about it okay you you traverse from being amiable and familiar and friendly and open and all the rest of it to being downright threatening to some people yeah. because choices have got to be made bets have got to be placed risks have got to be taken mm. prices have got to be paid okay exactly. and that's what we call real politics okay now there's an awful lot of so-called political art no, as i say take the so-called out an awful lot of political art full of good intentions okay but it sort of works within its own little orbit okay and if all you're interested in is getting people to feel Welsh, fine. Okay, art is absolutely conducive to that. It's kind of ritual practice of affiliation and emotional provocation by the encounter with aesthetic uh, values, the colours of the flags, the way they're fluttering, the, the massing of them, notoriously in history, the rallying around them, notoriously in the context of military use, and all the rest of it. But if you want to go on and actually transform structures of power and their respective <laughs> territorializations, I'm not sure that art's got very much to do with that, actually. It's quite fascinating. Anyway, there we go. No, thanks, John. That's really fascinating because I think in some ways, I think I, mean, I agree with you. I, mm -hmm. I remember reading, I think it was Rockwell, uh, talks about art, art, you know, how far can art go as a political Mm. Device. And he said, well, um, I mean, in some ways, he, his argument is that art is not political until it meets the political in some way or other, or it meets mm. somebody who can make it political, use it as a political uh, uh, mm. device. And he talks about art being totems, in some totems. Tal tal and talisman, particularly mm. talisman. There's a really nice kind of essay about the talisman aspect of art and he talks about Guernica oh, yeah. in a way. He says, you know, well it wasn't the artwork that actually was the political, you know, that helped things move. It was actually the artist uh, Picasso's own persona mm. and also the people who encountered that art were actually, you know, able to were actually operating making the art make, you know creating the political environment or creating the, the change that was involved. Mm -hmm. the, art, the art was a, more of a case of a, 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 a device in order for, to instigate something, but not to achieve it. Mm -hmm. you know? So there's, there's that scenario and, and, and kind of like, so I'm quite, you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, in some ways I kind of try and say, well, I don't think art can change the world. No. I've never been a believer of that. I think we can certainly um, visualize something, we can bring something into the world in some way but mm. as a as a, an artwork itself could not change something mm. because that, there's mm. there's a lot more behind a change than somebody making a piece of work you mm. know for it so 
Mm. It's a harder I mean, job. Yeah, I mean, can you think, Can I was going to ask you a simpler question, actually, which is, can you think of an example to which you can point us, other than your own work, of course, that you think is particularly successful? Um, again, you know, somebody like maybe, Let's I don't know, Alfredo Jarre, you know, just think about his work and the way that he operates within um, environments of, you know, of, of, of war and kind of bringing that, bringing kind of issues to the, to the forefront in regards to the crew, you know, kind of massacres, and genocide, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, you know, I think he's, he's, he's quite a powerful, um, 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 you know, kind of powerful kind of uh, artist within that type of context. Mm. Yeah. I also think somebody like, you know, I mean, Francis um, Alice is one of my favorite artists. And so, sorry, that, can you say that again? Francis Alice. Oh, yes. He's one of my favorite, you know, kind of go-to artists in terms of reference points. And he did, I mean, he did the Green Mile, um, which is, you know, in his, I think it was in Israel. And he kind of walks this, this um, boundary, this, this uh, boundary that was created as a ceasefire zone. Mm. And he does it in quite a, 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 a blasé way where he's dripping paint, mm -hmm. green paint along this, this, uh, this, this, this um, the demarcation line. Um, to, to, to try and raise awareness and what happens is he, he makes this video and in the video I had a few issues with the video as well well he's just walking with this paint you know he's a he's a he's a westerner he's coming to you know this country he's walking with this paint he's been given the, uh, the poetic license to walk with this paint dripping out of the can along this line you know the green the green line uh, and then just and then and then you know people are looking baffled at him and bewildered and then off he goes again. So he's coming and out. Hmm. Uh, but I think um, that the power of that is when he starts to um, get people involved from both sides of the argument hmm. and starts to talk about this line and the issues around this line. Um, and the particular piece, um, its power is in it's in it's in the conversations that happen afterwards. Um, mm. after the event, after the action. Mm. It's sort of setting the emotional tone, isn't it? Yeah. That's for right. that to happen. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, I've had my say, I think. Could I just, could I just add as well um, that um, I think the, the, the work of Larissa Sansor that you mentioned, mm. in, in the way in which, I mean, I remember seeing that piece in, in Liverpool, and um, I mean, she opened up a whole um if you like vista around archaeology and, and how things that are buried in in land can then be discovered later on and those discoveries are archaeological mm. but relate to a particular group of people i mean it's obviously clearly referencing the archaeology um that's that goes back in time where where Israel and the, and the Jewish people have lived and claim it through their archaeology. Whereas, um, so she, she did a whole parody about a Palestinian kind of uh, referencing of, 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 you know, it was obviously a complete um, fiction where, where she was referencing things that had been buried and then discovered and then I think it was a fiction, it might not have been, but there were, there were instances where she was claiming that this land was actually before those discoveries by the other, you know, another group, if you like, to, to, to open it out just to groups. And, and that, that those discoveries actually made that land historically though, that somebody else's. I mean, I just, and, and I, I, it was just the, the question that John asked there that made me think about, um, you're not gonna change, the world with um, with art, but it certainly makes you think about the different ways in which you can understand people's political perspectives or their understandings, um, mm. and and the work that you know might not seem provocative that you do. I'm sure you must have got people who have got deep rooted feelings about things that suddenly probably come to the surface quite rapidly because it's an emotional subject. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you talked about um, was it um, Marcus Coates? Yes. Um, and you, uh, who I, his work I don't know at all. Um, and you talked about humour. Yes. Right now, um, 
I, I, again, Brett's in the background. But this business of how you get people to change their minds, basically, or alter their order of priorities. You know, I didn't think this is important, now I think it is. Or I used to think this was bad, now I can see actually it's quite good. That basic change involves very complex mechanisms, doesn't it? It's not just that you've got to hear at the level of logic the uh, the positions stated. So, for example, uh, you know, if if you um, start using uh, I don't know racist speech, right, um, and you start attributing uh, universal characteristics to a biological category on the one hand, and then you have that done to yourself, and you find yourself thinking that's utterly unreasonable. So therefore, your own practice of doing it must also be unreasonable. You know, that's called experiencing a contradiction, isn't it? And what people do when they face that is either go into, go into denial and become very assertive and defensive, or they sort of go grudgingly, um, uh, well, I can see now that, you know, uh, I, uh, what I was doing was, you know, wrong or, you know, and, and, and perhaps incrementally change their position. Now, humour is one of these um, experiences, you know, laughter involves a, a, a kind of a bodily response, which is on the whole pleasurable. People seek to, re, re, to reproduce pleasurable experiences. You know, that was a good joke, you know, let's hear it again, sort of thing. Um, in relation to uh, the experience of, a, of, of, of essentially contradictions between various ideas, you know, you expect something to be, um, um, I don't know, wise, and guess what? It's shown by the comedian to be ridiculous. Yeah. So you go, oh, <laughs> you know, right. And what you learn from that is, of course, that the wise are ridiculous, you know, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, and that sort of mobilizing of a visceral, I, I, I'm a great one for saying art is about mobilizing the body behind ideas. You, you talk about, um, um, no, I've forgotten that, I wrote it down. Um, you know, give, giving a uh, high. Uh, absolutely classic idea, isn't it? That, you know, you, you, your, your art provides vehicles for the for ideas. Okay. Now, I'm not interested in the in the, in the vehicles that ideas travel in. What I'm interested in is how they impact on the body, because once the body's got it, the body is the vehicle for ideas. And this old rational versus emotional sort of dualism sort of collapses, and that's what that's the great strength for artists. They don't have to bother with all this you know, rational stuff. What I'm doing now, you see, what they have to body it, bother about is the fact that I'm waving my hands about, you know, uh, to emphasize a point. See, that's a sort of performative, physically embodied, if you like, kind of, um, what should we call it? Realization of the idea. Okay, so it's not just existing as an idea, it's actually uh, um, becomes a sort of mode of being in a, in a moment. Do, do you recognize what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay. Um, now, I think art can do that, actually. It can get people, if it's very good art, and uh, let's face it, there's an awful lot of crap. Um, if it's really good, like Brecht, <laughs> you know, you can, you can get people to, to, it can become a vehicle for people moving. And uh, that's, I think that, that's the ambition, it uh, should be the ambition for artists. Um, who want to be political, you know. Um, I mean, for example, there's an awful lot of it, uh, political art around um, mobilising uh, um, to mitigate uh, climate change, isn't there? And a lot of it's just uh, utterly routine, tedious, doesn't engage. But some of it actually, you know, hits the, hits the, hits the right buttons of the right people. Who can whose behaviour you want to change, whose thinking you want to change, exactly. and so on. Exactly. Anyway, uh, sorry, I've, I've gone on about two. The right people. Is it, is, mm -hmm. I think that's quite, you know, this is the important thing, isn't it? Get, getting the right people in yes. order for changes to occur. I mean, it's great mm -hmm. that, you know, you talk about this notion of humour. I remember reading about, is it Zizek talked about, the, you know, humour is a, is, is, oh, yes, is a yes. gesture of, of, of unveiling, you know, yes. revealing yes. and unveiling. Um, yes. That's that scenario, and he talks about impulses, repressed impulses. Yeah, like that, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he's he's very um, psych psychoanalytic, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you